I think when you read Child in the Forest, you can tell that it's true. It's from the heart. Winifred Foley sent some stuff to Woman's Hour in London and she said she was absolutely amazed to be asked to go and read this piece that she'd written. Um, five minute piece, they wanted her to read it herself. She went to London and she said she was scrubbing other people's floors one day and the next day she was walking up the steps of Broadcasting House. And I was thrilled to bits when I got there because on the programme was Laurie Lee. Now my daughter brought on from grammar school, side her with Rosie, which I thought was absolutely wonderful. And I can't tell you to be in the same room as Laurie Lee. As a result of that, Woman's Hour wrote to her and said, she didn't think that she should just be writing these little snippets of life in Briarley in the Forest of Dean. She should have a go at setting down the whole thing, her autobiography, which is what she did. I was born in 1914, the fourth child of Charlie and Margaret Mason. When I came into the world, Dad was away in Wales because work was short in the forest. A letter home to Mam included his love to my little fat Paul. So Paul stuck. And though I was baptised Winifred in the village chapel, Paul, I remained. The great thing about rich books like this one is that it's full of all the things that the official histories leave out. It's a book by someone living at the time about their daily life. It's, it's, not about, it's not about the big things as much as the small things, the domestic, the homely. And of course, it's not just um, an autobiography. It's a working class autobiography, and it's an autobiography by a working class woman. So these are the voices of history that we don't hear. Winifred Foley was brought up in the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire. Her father was a miner. His wages barely covered their food costs, and there was little left over for clothes, toys, or any kind of luxury. But in some ways, she was lucky. She lived in the forest, a world rich with natural beauty and an ever-changing landscape. Her childhood memories reflect the joy and amazement of everything around her. I can remember sitting on that step and I remember putting my nose in those floors and I was like one drunk. I couldn't get over it. It was just like red velvet and it was perfume. And I can remember putting my nose into that. Beautiful day, the sun was shining through. And I remember having the most peculiar turn. I must have been about 10 or 11. And I suddenly felt it was all so beautiful and I felt completely unnecessary to it. There was the insects, you could even buzz in, there was the squirrels in the trees, and I was superfluous to it all. And I thought to myself, what am I? Who am I? Why am I? It was weird. But it, it, the beauty struck me and it was quite overwhelming. The whole, the weather was perfect, the sun shone through the trees, the foxgloves, it was too much to take in nearly. Traditionally, the Forest of Dean was a mining community. Its abundance of oaks created seams of coal, which in the 19th century were opened to meet industry's demand for fuel. But low wages and poor conditions were to lead to an event which would increase the suffering of the mining community. Winifred Foley's father, Charlie Mason, was destined to be particularly involved. This is London calling the British Isles, a crisis. All efforts at compromise between the Trade Union Council and the government regarding the position in the coal fields have failed. We regret to have to announce that a general strike will begin tomorrow at midnight. I remember the strike at a very terrible time, when we were even poorer than usual, but what the thing that struck me the most during it was the minor owners came and ordered a meeting for the striking men they wanted to talk to them. And uh, on this stage was these very posh people, and I remember one of the ladies had a fur coat, and there was the miners in their mufflers, really looking a very drab, pathetic lot. 
And uh, these miners were very high-handed, you know, and said, we half a loaf is better than none, and what were the men thinking about? They should go back to work. There was a slump in the coal and all that. And I can remember, my dad was only a little man, I thought he was big, and he was very grey-faced by no one's thing. And he was a bit nervous at first, and then he started, he put up his hand, and I saw those people on the stage squirm. Literally, he had them squirming. They could not answer his questions with justification. And the mood in the hall from despair and that changed. He inspired the men to carry on. It, and it was, a, it was a, a real moment to witness. The official histories of the strike in the Forest of Dean tell us a little about Charlie Mason as an institutional figure. I mean, he was extraordinary. Clearly, he was a member of the Rural District Council, a left-wing Labour member of that. So he's vocal, he's political, he's a, he's a very prominent during the strike and during the lockout. He's an intellectual, working-class, self-taught intellectual. He reads Lenin, he reads H.G. Wells. His colleagues, fellow comrade miners, and he are meeting regularly to talk politics and economics and current affairs, you know, this is like the university of the school of life and it's all going on in the Forest of Dean. Winifred inherits all that uh, love of books and when he eventually lends her a copy of Edgar Allan Poe to read, uh, she's sitting there reading that one night and she's so caught up in this tale of terror that she lets the fire go out in the cottage. All the time the glow of the fire went down, down until there was barely enough to read by. Concentrating on the printed pages was less frightening than allowing my mind to dwell on the lurking horrors crowding right now up around my chair. This is exactly where oral memory scores highest because her father had to walk three miles to the nearest pit in whatever weather and conditions were prevailing at the time. He gets into the pit, he works underground all day in cramped conditions. Forest of Dean mine seams are low. That means that miners work on their knees or on their bellies. So all day long, their clothes are getting wet and muddy. When they come out, they have to walk home. The first thing that has to happen is that those clothes have got to be taken off him, he's got to be dried and warmed up, and the clothes have got to be dried in front of the fire. If the fire is out, he has to wear cold clothes, wet clothes the following day. And I don't know that official histories of working class life pick up on things like that. You've got to ask someone, haven't you? You've got to say, what was it like in the cottage? What was the fire about? Why did you have to keep the fire alight? What was it like for Dad when he came home covered in wet and mud and grime? You know, what was it like? What, what was the priorities in the family? And you get all that from a book like this. The television drama A Child in the Forest highlights an experience that Winifred had as a child. Come now, pal. Your dad have made this special for you. So let's drink it up and get better for him. My hands are wet, so... It cemented the very special relationship she had with her father that continued all of her life. Well, I'm in my 87th year, and I don't think I'd have lived if it would not been for my dad. I had a terrible bout of pneumonia, and the doctor said I'd be lucky to last through the night, he told my mum. My dad had to go to work, and I just kept coming out of like a black hole. As I go, and I thought, if I could see my dad, I want my dad. And he, as soon as he come in from the pit, he come up in his pit door, and I can remember he had the loveliest kind of... And he got out to me, and he said, your, your dad's here. And he said, no, you've got to get better for your dad, old buddy. And he started to tell me how they couldn't manage without me. One Friday, Dad came up with a cup in his hand and an expression of great pleading in his eyes. With the patience of Job and his own incredible gifts of love and encouragement, he got me to take eight spoonfuls of his little brew. Aye, doctor says it'll make you strong again. Well, I'd be fair flummoxed. All for me? All for he. So drink up and get strong for your old dad, old bat. I did get better and go out to play on the temp. I did all them things that Dad wanted me to do, like making me all through his teachers to go in. Him was the best dad in the world. 
like uh, a large number of Dean miners, he was blacklisted and unable to get a job in a local pit. I mean, the end of the strike, the end of the lockout, what happened was that of 8,000 people working underground in the Dean mines, 6,500 of them, who had drifted back to work slowly anyway and broken the strike, gone back as blacklegs, were taken back on by the coal managers, by the colliery managers, and given their jobs permanently on a rather poor deal. But that's how the lockout ended. One and a half thousand miners who had stood firm, held the line all the way through the strike and the lockout, were left at the end with nothing. And he was one of those. I mean, in fact, I think he'd been pretty close to the top of the list. And he ends up having to walk 12 miles to get a job in a coal pit. And, of course, finally dies in a pit accident. I was expecting my third child. I was about seven months pregnant, and we had a telegram from home, and it just said, Dad hurt, please come. And it was not from my, any of the family, it was from a friend. Oh, I was mad. We were so, I hadn't even got any decent shoes to wear. We had to borrow some shoes to go. And uh, I said, um, Sid went out and phoned. There was only one phone in the village, and when he came back, I looked at his face, and I knew. I can't tell you what happened. I think I screamed, and something so dreadful that it was more than I could take. It completely destroyed my belief in any God, any logic in life. Anyway, I, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. I thought that he'd been, he had, he'd had been killed with a fall in the pit because he'd got a bit deaf and he hadn't heard the fall. And it caused my baby to be born premature. The shock caused me to have a go on the thyroid, that have operation. And quite honestly, life's never got on a completely even keel since. This is The Child from the Forest, Final Weeks Part 2, study all.
The year 2000 was remarkable for Winifred. The BBC commissioned a new radio dramatisation of her book, produced by Viv Beebe, and HTV made a half-hour drama of her work, which was filmed on location in the Forest of Dean. OK, for rehearsal then, stand by. And action. I've got a lovely cake. I baked it myself. I used a whole egg and butter. No? Oh. Will you take a cup of tea now, Miss Hale? I'm the dialect yes. coach working with the actors on this, on this project and the Forest of Dean accent is a very individual, or it was a very individual thing and still is to some of the people here. Uh, to give you an example, um, if you were to say uh, sweep that sooty chimney in a Forest of Dean accent you would say zwip that there zooty chimney or zwip that there zooty chimmock which wouldn't be understood by the majority of the country. So my job is to make it understandable to everybody. All the luxuries of being on location. Marvellous. <laughs> Sugar, coffee, milk. The drama stars EastEnder actor John Altman as Dad. Ma'am is being played by Melanie Hill. The adaptation was written by Julia Jones, who, being quite near in age to Winifred, closely identified with elements of her story. Lots of butter. And butter, I Almost a hundred children from all over the country were auditioned for the part of the sisters, Bess and Paul. The two eventually chosen happened to live near to the forest itself. Have you been a with long hair? Yeah. Oh, I didn't, I didn't have lovely long hair like you. So, Winifred, how, how like your mum am I? I'll tell you what, you look just right for mum. Really? Yeah, but my mum, you yeah. better, I'm not saying this is not, you ask me facts, my mum yeah. has nothing like it's good looking. Oh, but she, Nobody would look good enough to be my dad. Oh, I can believe right. that. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Mm. Oh. Mm. It's a real really pleasure really to be doing this, you know. Thank you, John. Really wanted to do it, and well, since, since I read the what. script. The fact that these people had so little, except that Winifred as a little girl had the forest, which was such a wonderful place for a child to grow up. But they had so little of the comforts of life, and yet they never, they never moaned about it. They got on with it, you know, they got on with their um, life, and they got on with it with humour. And Covering my behind was a problem. All of us, my mum had like four girls yeah. and no money. People from all kinds of social classes and walks of life are very interested in people who write. And of course, the people of the Forest of Dean are very proud because for many years the people of the Forest of Dean have suffered prejudice. And um, so when one of their number does something recognisable, um, especially of a literary kind, um, if that's not claiming too much, um, they're particularly proud and grateful, I think. Over 80 years ago, this was the school that a shy five-year-old Winifred came to. Today, it's still going strong. Winifred is always a popular visitor and loves to encourage the youngsters to ask questions. Who was the biggest influence on you when you were a child? Why and when did you decide to write a book? How has Briley changed since you lived there? What are your happiest memories of your childhood? Although we were very, very poor and we had nothing like you turn out, I had lots and lots of memories, wonderful memories. They like come into school even. We I don't know how you children get to school, but when I was a child there was a beautiful oak forest from here down to Briarley. And we used to come to school through the oak forest and there was lovely red squirrels in the trees. We had to get over a little stream and up a big hill and we used to look for things to eat and we used to have all kinds of play on the way. I loved it. It was beautiful coming through this <coughs> lovely forest to school. It was soon obvious that I was an absolute duff at arithmetic, that the humiliation of being bottom of the class in these subjects was made up by Miss Hale reading to us. She took us far away with Lorna Doon, Alice's adventures in Wonderland and the secret garden. As she went along, we followed, spellbound. Miss Hale was always ready to listen. Besides, 
She never commented on the weird unsuitability of our clothes. She never appeared to notice the dried soap flakes on our necks, camouflaged in the flea bites. Going to school, they became a wonderful daily treat. Sometimes it happens at school, you know, that a student will come to me and they say, Hey, miss, your mother's been in as if I hadn't realised, you know. And I say, that's right. Really? We've got her book at home, or my grand's re read her book, or even recently one of the children had read her book, you know. And I, and I sometimes exploit it, you know. I'll say, well, well you know, my mum can remember when. And because it's my mum and she's read a book, they'll listen. Life was wonderful, except for one constant nagging irritation, hunger. Naturally enough, most of the stories we made up were filled with an abundance of delicious food. Those childhood dreams of food influenced the rest of her life. At 14 years old, she went into service, and this led her to meet Sid, the man who was to become her husband. And together, they had four children. But her daughter recalls how the memory of childhood poverty left its mark. She was the absolute mum. She was born to be a mum, but, uh, you know, food was an obsession with her and we always left the house with food being proffered and came back to the house to food. You know, she would run after us with pieces of bread and homemade jam and great chunks of cake. She used to make cake in slabs, you know, great slabs of cake. And my brothers used to bring all their friends for mum's cake and they used to insult it but eat it, you know, so. My children put up with a lot, I can tell you, because we had no money, but if anybody, like my brother-in-law, come down with a load of odd bits of paint, I would paint. They never knew what they were coming home to. I'd even put in a knocked out, a built up grate and put a lopsided grate in. Oh, they suffered. I can remember my mum making kitchen units out of orange boxes. I can remember that she had orange boxes and put saucepans in them. But it wasn't until I was 16 that we had an, in, an indoor bathroom flush loo and so on. So I was always very reluctant to bring my friends from secondary school home in case they needed to go to the loo and they'd have to go to our Elson toilet. Sadly, Sid Winifred's husband was to die in 1998, but their daughter Jennifer remembers with affection his role in the family. The relationship in our household was that my father, who had had the benefit of a pretty good, rigorous education, was considered the brains of the household. And to some extent he was, in that if we brought maths homework home, we couldn't do it, or Latin or anything, my father could always help us. He was the brains, he could help him with a bit of Latin or other. I was nothing, I was in the kitchen. But I was being educated all the time by listening to him and reading the books they brought home from school. All the while, of course, she was this creative person. But she was receiving, she honestly received neither encouragement nor any kind of um, recognition for it from us. It's quite interesting that we'd all left home before she got published, you know. It was the empty nest syndrome plus the empty nest uh, opportunities that made her able to pursue what she'd obviously been wanting to pursue for probably 20 or 30 years before. When the book was serialised on Woman's Hour, the enthusiastic reaction of the listeners led to its publication. For the first time in their lives, Sid and Winifred had money in the bank. This meant they could buy a home of their own. They paid me, seemed an awful lot of money for the for broadcasting it, you see. Then they printed it and they printed 15,000 copies. We hadn't got a bank book. I think we had about 15 quid. And I didn't know what to do at first. I needed so many things, I couldn't make up my mind what to buy. But we did buy a new mattress. We'd had a mattress for 30 years, that was the first buy. I bought Sid, he used to have two pairs of pants, one in the wash and one down. I went and bought him six. I went into Marks and went and bought him six pairs of pants, I thought that. I think the reason the book became so popular when it was published and why everybody wanted to listen to it when she was on the radio, uh, when the thing was serialised on the radio, I think it's about people connect with history of this kind because it rings a, a, a real bells. This is, they say, well, you know, I've got a dry old book about the general strike and I, well, I don't remember it quite like that, but this woman is telling me what conditions were like and actually I remember them being rather like that as well, you know. We didn't all live in the middle of some city somewhere. Some of us did live in the countryside and yes, it was rather like that. Life was like that. I remember that too. 
or else it provokes kinds of memories that we have. After I got a bit of what you call, I suppose you call it fame, and people wouldn't have they would have passed by when I was coming home from work in an old jacket and leaky Wellingtons and tied up. Started to be, oh, very pleasant, wanting books. No, then I suddenly realised I was ashamed of being ashamed. I think poverty is um, a humiliating experience and what's something that drives many people to escape from it or, or to not enter the abyss of poverty, if you, if you see. I, I, I consider that for many people poverty is a kind of an abyss that they don't want to fall down. Um, my parents always uh, offered a role model which completely dismissed material success. And I'm now extremely proud of myself that I would go scrubbing doorsteps, swelling down, to help make sure I earned 15 bob a week for doing all that work and every day. That's what I'm proud of. And I'm very proud of everybody who does a blooming hard, monotonous jobs in life. And I think it's high time that humanity started to get its uh, sense of, of um, quality right. I think she feels driven all the time to keep presenting the events of the first half of the 20th century to us and our children because there are these huge lessons to be learned that she can she thinks she can clearly see haven't been learned when you think of it whatever the people who are very important in this world really important are the people who make our shoes, make our clothes, and especially as important as the dustman. We wouldn't we be in a mess without them? They take mm. on. So whatever job you do, dear, you can be very proud, very proud. She's been struggling to find who she is and what she is since Daddy went. And I think one of the ways that she finds um, something to pin to is through the children. He was the best dad in the whole world. No, in the whole world. Oh, world, because he was. He was the best dad in the whole world. Yeah. All the time, the glow of the fire went down. Down until it was barely It's the voice of Winifred by. Foley's granddaughter, Anna, that's been heard pages, reading the part of Paul in this documentary. And just to prove that dreams right can come true, the BBC chair. has chosen her out of hundreds to play her grandmother in their new radio dramatisation. Um, I did say to Anna on the way that she's perhaps got the chance to articulate the one thing my mother wanted to articulate, which was her, that he was the best dad in the world, you know, to have the chance to say those words in a way that's convincing. This is to, speaking for my mother, isn't it? And, the, you know, to be able to, to keep that in the family, to say that. But I, I think it's hard for her to grasp what a privilege it is to say that particular phrase for my mother. He was the best dad in the world. I can't, that's not the way I like it. Best, no, but even was it, he was the best bit. dad in the world. He really was the best dad in the whole world. You put the emphasis on the world at the end. If, you, if I tell me if I'm doing wrong. No, you're doing absolutely great.